Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Right, um, let's just continue from where we left off. Um, let's do a quick recap of the um, first session. Uh, we very briefly try to understand uh, what is worship and what is ministry, and then worship ministry together, what it really means. And, uh, and then we got into the life of Abraham and how God calls him out of his place, asks him to get out, and he goes out. Um, and then um, we begin to learn about the altars that he built. Right, and the first altar we are calling it as the altar of obedience um, because it kind of signifies that he obeyed. It was by faith, as Hebrews chapter 11 verse 8 says, it was by faith that Abraham obeyed. Uh, and, uh, and then there he built an altar to the Lord where God speaks to him as Shechem. Okay, um, now let's go on from, uh, let's be in Genesis chapter 12 for a while. Um, let's be in the book of Genesis for a while. Um, so the first altar that he built is um, <clears throat> is mentioned in the place of Shechem. That's um, from verse six onwards, right? Abraham passed through the land to a place of Shechem, as far as the Terebinth tree of Moreh, and the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. So when God appeared to him and spoke with Abraham and he makes the covenant again, he tells him to your descendants I will give this land. Now here God is saying, okay, this is the land and I'm going to give this to your descendants. You see all these people, the Canaanites living in this land the land that they are in later which we get to know is that's the land of milk and honey uh, is is given to the descendants of abraham and so abraham his response is he builds the altar and then what he does after that is kind of significant or if i was there i would ask him why is that he moves that's what it says in verse 12 uh, verse 8 sorry chapter 12 verse 8 it says and he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. Um, I, I, I don't know why, okay? <laughs> uh, because if, it's, if, if God appeared to me and said, okay, hey, you know, Russian, this is the land, uh, you're gonna be here. And I'm like, all right, great. Let's build, put on a firm foundation and build myself a mansion because this is the land, you know, you're gonna give me and my descendants. Uh, but not Abraham. Uh, he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. Now, when you look at the map, you see where Bethel is, right? It's not too far off Shechem. It's just further down south from Shechem. Okay. Um, and then to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Now here, this is the second altar that he is building. God had not appeared to him. He had not uh, reassured the promise uh, or done anything like that. Abraham moves from Shechem. He comes down to Bethel and then he builds another altar to the Lord uh, and he calls on the name of the Lord. Okay, now that is an act of worship. Calling on the name of the Lord is an act of worship. Now this, the very first act of worship uh, where people call on the name of the Lord is found in Genesis chapter 4. Let's go to Genesis chapter 4. And the last verse in Genesis chapter 4, verse 26. Right? Genesis 4, verse 26. It shouldn't be hard to find. Uh, you know, the chapter is pretty sad and pretty tragic. It's a story between Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel, and then um, Adam and Eve are sad about it. And then later, a hundred years later, uh, you know, Adam and Eve begot Seth, right? Verse 25, that's what it says. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth, which means, for God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, who Cain killed. Verse 26, it says, and as for Seth, 
to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. It's amazing, isn't it? Uh, right? So uh, he's blessed with a child, and then men, we don't know how many people, uh, you know, we, we, we just don't know if it's, a, if it's just one family or an entire town or city or a village. It says, the men began to call on the name of the Lord. Um, that's just simple and a simple act of worship, and that's exactly what we see uh, Abraham doing in verse tw uh, chapter 12, uh, in verse 8. He says, he moved down from Shechem, he came down for the south to Bethel, he pitched his tent over there, and he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Uh, now, this second altar, let we are going to uh, title it as the altar of intimacy and of the pilgrim walk. Okay, an altar of intimacy and of the pilgrim walk. Um, so, what does that mean? Is that a lot as this Abraham has been going on on this journey. He's become, you know, his familiarity with God has increased, and that has resulted in his growth in intimacy of who this God is. He's growing in this intimacy. It's like this walk of faith, uh, right? Um, as we as we call it, is like in this Christian walk from the time we started, and as we've been walking in this Christian, uh, you know, walk of faith, our int our relationship with God has increased, isn't it? Like, is there any one of you who can say that I'm still, you know, that you are still the same as how you were in day one as a Christian? No, right? So, like, you know, on day one, you encounter Jesus, you give your life to him, and then your life has, you know, your relationship with Jesus has only gotten deeper and intimate in your walk as a Christian, isn't it? And that same thing kind of signifies in Abraham's life, Abraham's life, is that he grew in intimacy. And that's why in the second altar, it doesn't say that God appeared to him, God spoke to him, God reassured his promises, God is renewing his covenant, nothing of that sort. In the previous place called Shechem, God tells him, you know, I'll give you this land. He moves from there, Abraham moves from there, and then he, he maybe he's encountered something of the Lord, and he just builds an altar and he worships him there. Okay, and this kind of, again, signifies uh, in parallel in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 9. Hebrews 11, verse 9. Can someone read uh, for us, please? Hebrews 11, verse 9. And can someone else be ready with Acts chapter 7, verse 5, please? Right? Hebrews 11, 9, someone? Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 9. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, and the heirs with him on the same promise. Right. Thank you. Okay, so here it says, even when he reached the land God promised him, uh, he lived there by faith. Like he was like a foreigner living in tents. That's what it says, right? So he, like, like I said that when God tells him that this is the place, this is the land I'm going to give you descendants. He didn't build a mansion for himself, but he continued to live in tents. Now, uh, the temporary nature of the tent uh, is that he was willing to not have his roots in this world. That he was constantly looking for a city, for a land that he would, uh, you know. For, for a city that was eternal, and we will learn about it uh, more, uh, you know, in the different chapters as we go on. But so, and that's why we're calling it is uh, this altar as the land, uh, as the altar of intimacy and of the pilgrim walk. That uh, Abraham was continue uh, was constantly living his life as a pilgrim. He was not willing to 
uh, you know, build his route into into the world, or he was not easily swayed by what he saw. Okay, and so it's also encouraging us that we, as a children of God, is that we don't get too caught up in the things of this world, uh, or you know, where we where we build treasures for ourselves where moth and everything else kind of destroys it but we are constantly encouraged to fix our eyes on eternity or you know on the it on the things above um, as Christians and so uh, that's another encouragement that we can take off and there's a very wonderful poem by Thomas R Taylor it says I'm but a stranger here heaven is my home earth is the desert drear heaven is my home danger and sorrow stand around me on every hand heaven is my fatherland heaven is my home and so it's, it's just like a pilgrim's progress kind of a, a poem uh, that we are con constantly encouraged to live as pilgrims um, in this world okay so that's the second altar that abraham uh, built um, let's come down and go on let's go on this journey um just a little bit more so verse 9 it says so um verse 8 let's just read verse 8 one more time uh and so he moved there to the mountain east of Bethel and he pitched his tent with uh, with Bethel on the west and I on the east there he built an altar to the Lord and and called on the name of the Lord this is the second altar right verse 9 it says so Abraham journeyed going on still toward the south he continues to you know he pitched his tent he uh, he removed his tent he packed his tent and then he kept going south verse 10 says now there was famine in the land and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. Okay, so uh, let's stop there. And um, now we know that again, let's look at the map. Now he look at where Shechem and Bethel is. And um, right, he was, verse 9 says he came further down south. We don't really know where exactly. Uh, could be Hebron, could be Beersheba, um, you know, or sure, somewhere down south. But then wherever he pitched his tent, there was severe famine in the land. And so he decides to go further down south all the way to Egypt. Now from verse 11 to verse 20 is the story of what happens in Egypt. We, I, I, we don't want to go into the details of what happens, everything, but you know what happens in Egypt. And so that's the story of Abraham in Egypt from verse 11 to verse 20 of chapter 12 in Genesis. Okay, if you're interested, you can read about it later. Um, now let's come down to chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 1. It says, then Abram went up. It's amazing how Bible gives directions, isn't it? Up is north. Right? So then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had and Lot with him to the south. Abraham, look at this verse too. Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. Now, uh, when Abraham was coming out of Egypt, he came out with two headaches, right? He became very rich. Something happened in Egypt that he flourished, uh, and then uh, he was very rich. We'll read, uh, uh, you know. And then we also know that Hagar came along with him. How do we know that? Because in Genesis chapter 16, verse 1, Genesis 16, verse 1, it says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid servant whose name was Hagar, an Egyptian. Made sir. That means it doesn't clearly say that you know. Okay, she was there before there, or she is. No, these are the details or uh, Easter eggs kind of thing that the Bible gives us, and then you know, let makes us think, and you have to. And so, but simply says that Hagar must have joined him on this journey from uh, Egypt. And so, when Abram came out of Egypt, he became very rich and he came with Hagar okay so we all know where the story ends um, now let's go on um, verse 13 but, uh, sorry uh, Genesis chapter 13 verse 3 hey, everybody's alive right everybody doing well <coughs> okay I hope so hey, verse 3 it says 
And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel, to the place where his tent uh, had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. So he's saying, from Egypt, he went up to Bethel, where he had first built an altar. Okay, so you remember he built, he pitches uh, the tent and he builds an altar there. His Bible is saying that's where he went back to the place of the altar which he had made there at first, verse 4. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. So he's going back to that same altar way what he built uh, in Bethel. And there he, he's, uh, he remembers everything. Okay, Lord, I went to Egypt. I did all these things and I'm back here. And I am reminded of your promises, and so I'm going to worship you again at this place. Um, it's almost like uh, I'm, I'm, maybe he's saying, okay, Lord, I'm sorry I left in the first place. Because that's the place where God tells him, okay, this is the land I'm going to give you a descendants. And Abraham packed his tent and he moved on. Okay, uh, now verse 5, Lot also, who went with Abraham, had flocks and herds and tents. That means Lot also became rich. Verse 6, now the, law, the land was not able to support them, that they might dwell together, for their possessions was so great that they could not dwell together. The, notice those words, okay? They, for, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. Okay, um, there's, there's so many... Um, There's so many things that are happening in here. Uh, Subhashish, I see you raised your hand. Yeah, you have a question? But do you have a question, Subhashish? OK. All right, if you're speaking, your mic is muted. If you have a question, feel free to unmute and speak because I see that you've raised your hand. All right. I guess that was a mistake. Okay. Now, uh, guys, uh, just, just continue to notice with me here. Abraham and his nephew, Lot, they were in Egypt for a while. And when they're coming out of Egypt, they're coming out as rich people. Right? A very rich people with a lot of possession. Now let's um, come to chapter 15, Genesis chapter 15. Okay. Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. Then he, God, said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. Now, what is, what's happening here? God is prophesying to Abram about the time the Israelites will be in the land of Egypt. Okay, God is prophesying 400 years ahead of time. He's saying, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a strange land, and they will serve them. They will serve the people that, you know, in the land that they are in, that is the Egyptians, and they will afflict them 400 years. That means the Egyptians will afflict the Israelites for 400 years. Verse 14 And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. What is he saying? When Israelites come out of Egypt, they will come out with great possessions. Okay? So, yes, the Bible is packed with, with mysteries like this. You know, it's like Abraham's life is almost showing, prophesying, he's living a life that his descendants will live. So he will go to Egypt, and, but when he comes out of Egypt, he becomes very rich. Right, And so same thing, what God is telling Abraham in chapter 15, verse 13 and 14, is saying, okay, your descendants is going to be in, they are going to be in Egypt. Uh, they're going to be strangers in the strange land, but they will come out, they come out, they're going to come out with a lot of possessions. 
they're going to come out with a lot of gold and silver and whatnot, right? Because that's the gold and silver they used to build the golden calf and later the tabernacle and whatnot, okay? So it's like his life is kind of projecting what's going to happen, kind of prophesying. It's just brilliant, okay, what's happening in the life of uh, Abraham. Uh, now, and, and we know that there is, uh, let's continue reading. I hope you all are with me. Verse 6, it says, um, verse 5, let's read verse 5. Genesis chapter 13, verse 5. Lot also who went with Abraham had flocks and herds and tents. And now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together. For their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. So Abraham said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. <clears throat> Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. Uh, now, one of the things what we need to learn or know about this, uh, what when Abraham is saying, if you go to the left or to the right, uh, the patriarchs of those days always used north uh, as their main direction to tell which which side they wanted to go. And so what uh, Abraham is saying is, okay, pointing towards the north, uh, that's because that's what the patriarchs of those days and the people of those days did is, Keeping north as the reference, what Abraham is saying is, if you go to the east, I will go to the west. If you go to the west, I will go to the east. That's basically what's happening there, okay? Verse 10. Now, here's the difference between Lot and Abram. Verse 10, it says, The Lord and Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, what... Lot is looking at is the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go towards Zohar. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. Okay, um, so let's pause there, and um, and then come down all the way to. Uh, actually, let's read. Continue reading from verse fourteen, Genesis chapter thirteen, verse fourteen. It says, and the Lord said to Abram, after Lord had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from where look look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see. I give to you and your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees by Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. Huh. Okay. So, what is happening here? From, from Genesis chapter 13, we see uh, he, you know, Abraham is back from Egypt. He goes to Bethel, to the place where he originally had built an altar. Uh, and it's he's, and he, again, he's worshipping there. He almost like saying, he's, he's uh, reassuring his commitment to the Lord. Uh, you know, it's like sig signifying or symbolizing his uh, or the restoration of his former commitment uh, to the Lord in that first altar that he built in Bethel. And then be because of the strife between Abraham and Lot, uh, Lot goes a different place towards east and then Abraham stays in, uh, in the land. Uh, and then he builds an altar in verse, verse 18 of chapter 13 near the Terebinth uh, tree. Uh, now again, you know, it's. Uh, is anybody there in Hebrews chapter eleven? Okay, because that is corresponding to Hebrews. This altar that he builds in chapter thirteen, verse eight, corresponds to what Hebrews chapter eleven, verse ten has to say. Um, so, can someone read Hebrews chapter eleven, verse ten, please?
Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Right, thank you, Jafina. So uh, now while Lot had looked, you know, he, he looked at all the plains of, uh, you know, the Sodom and Gomorrah and all these beautiful lands that was like the garden of the Lord. That's what it says, isn't it? Lot looked with his eyes. All that is pleasing. Now, if Lot saw all these lands, I'm sure even Abraham could see what Lot saw. Now, Abraham could have easily said, hey, I brought you out. You wouldn't bring me out. Like, I'm the leader here. You know, you will get the land which I tell you to take. Abraham could have easily said all of that, but then Abraham doesn't do that. He says, Lot, you choose. You take the land whichever you want. And then the Bible says, Lot saw, and it was everything was, and he picked a land that was flourishing, that looked amazing. And, but Abraham, as it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10, he was confidently and constantly looking forward to a city with eternal foundations. Now, this is going back to the second uh, altar where he lived a life of pilgrim. He, for he knew that he did not want to have his roots down in this world. And he, his journey and his walk with God became so intimate that he knew that, okay, there is something eternal. That he was constantly looking for a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. This is the book of Hebrews talking about Abraham and, and how he was living. It's kind of supporting everything what Genesis chapter 12 and 13 has to say. Are you with me? Right? Uh, any questions? Any thoughts so far? Because that is the that is the third altar. A third uh, altar we're calling it as as the altar of commitment and separation. Well, why we why are we calling it the altar of commitment? Because he comes back from Egypt to the uh, place Bethel where he had first built the altar, and you see he's recommitting himself. It's like Lord, I have. It's almost like I've gone away from you. I'm committing, I'm coming and, you know, restore the relationship with you. And then he decides to separate himself from the things of the world. He says, Lord, you go your way, uh, but, you know, I'm going to live where God wants me to live. And he was constantly looking for a, a city that was, uh, whose maker and the builder was God. Right? <clears throat> So that was the third altar. And finally, uh, we come to the fourth altar, which we all are aware of. Uh, and we are calling it the altar of sacrifice. OK, so let's just pause here for a second. Uh, and uh, sorry for being redundant. But uh, is everybody following what's happening, you know, what we are learning so far? Yes, Pastor. OK, thank you. <coughs> Okay. I just want to make sure that I'm not losing you guys. Okay. <laughs> now let's look at the fourth altar, which is the altar of sacrifice. Um, Genesis chapter 2. Uh, sorry, Genesis chapter 22. Let's go to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. I've mentioned only verse 9 in the notes, but um, I want to read the, the whole this chapter from the top. <clears throat> Genesis 22 verse 1. It says, And now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. And so Abraham arose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. 
And he split the wood for burnt offering and arose and went to a place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. Verse 5, it says, And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to a place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, so he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Okay. That's enough reading, right? <laughs> um, wow. Yeah, you, you can never get tired or, or bored of reading this chapter. Um, the language that is used, the word, the choice of words, um, is just um, outstanding and and just and just so beautiful. Okay, so uh, we all know the story. God tests Abraham. He tells Abraham, uh, "Take your son, your only son." Does those choice of words remind you of another verse? <laughs> yeah, John three sixteen. My only son. This is my son, my only son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, right? He says, it's amazing. Uh, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering. And verse 3, it says, And so Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took up. Again, there is no... Uh, there is no mention of a question here or even a thought that, okay, Abraham thought this, Abraham thought that. Uh, very, what's interesting is that there is no mention of Sarah anywhere in the scene. So imagine, <laughs> imagine uh, what would have happened. Huh? So Abraham wakes up and says, um, yeah, you know, this uh, son that, we had to wait for a uh, hundred odd years or so. Uh, yeah, God wants me to sacrifice him. I'm sure Sarah would have sacrificed Abraham there, right? It's like, <laughs> right? Um, uh, but uh, just just think about. Um, we need to put ourselves in Abraham's shoes, isn't it? Um, from the time that he got to know about this uh, when God tells him to take Isaac and go and that he has to sacrifice him um, he must have gone through so many chains of thoughts uh, you know he must have been dying himself inside you know every second he, he must have died because it says it was not till the third day that they reached the place so there was a three-day journey. Uh, and again, the third day signifies something. <laughs> OK. And so for three days, it's almost like Abraham was dying on the inside, uh, but he was still obedient. 
right? He was still obedient to what God told him to do, and he was doing all of that. He took Isaac, and then uh, some of the Bible scholars and the historians claim that Isaac was a strong. He was a teenager by then, like an eighteen-year-old. Now, an eighteen-year-old versus a hundred-year-old, who will win the battle? And a, a teenager, a strong teenager, could easily overpower a very old man and could have ran away. Uh, somewhere along the way, Isaac also realizes it, okay. I don't know what Abraham was going through. I don't know what Isaac was going through. Because it says, they reached the place, Abraham built the altar, and Abraham bound Isaac. And through it all, Isaac asks a question. They're saying, Father, there's the wood is here, the knife is there, but where's the lamb for the sacrifice? And only God's wisdom could have helped Abraham to respond in the manner that he did. He says, don't worry about it, son. The Lord himself will provide a lamb for himself. All of this is pointing towards the cross, guys, isn't it? Like if you haven't realized it, Everything, this whole chapter is pointing for us to the cross, what's going to happen. Right? The Lord himself will provide for himself a lamb. Um, right? Uh, God will provide for himself a lamb. This is where we get the God's covenant name, Jehovah Jireh, that he is God, my provider. Right? Um, he, God will, pro verse 8, that is in... Chapter 22, God will provide for himself a lamb of burnt offering. So the two of them went together. <clears throat> and then they came to a place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there, and all of that. Okay, so um, now, uh, in all of this, we know li really that... Um, why, why are we calling it the altar of sacrifice when uh, he did not kill his son? Because sacrifice didn't really happen there. Right? But the, the story uh, or the moral of the story, so to say, is that God really didn't want Isaac. Uh, he wanted Abraham's heart, right? He wanted he wanted Abraham because it was Abraham who was actually upon the altar from day one. Because Abraham was surrendering his will. Abraham was surrendering, laying down everything at the altar from day one until day three, until they reached the place. So throughout the journey, it was actually Abraham who was on the altar. Uh, right? <clears throat> Now, can we go to Hebrews chapter 11? Hebrews chapter 11, I'll read for us, verse 17 to 19. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 to 19, it says, It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Now, Abraham knows that God says, he will bless my descendants. He'll give this land to my descendants. And my descendants are going to be like the sand, uh, the, uh, the number of grains in the sand, or the stars in the sky. He, he knows and he remembers all of these prophecy, uh, promises that God has told him. And he has seen so many, so many things being fulfilled. And so... Although Abraham was dying and he knew that, okay, even if Isaac dies, this God that I have gotten to know in this journey is able, is more than, more than able enough to raise him from the dead. Right? And so verse 18, it says, continues to say that even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Verse 19, Abraham, the reason that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life. And that in a sense, Abraham did not receive his son back from the dead. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. 
<sighs> okay. So that is the fourth altar of Abraham that he builds. The last one is the altar of sacrifice. Now, from the first one, we see that the first altar we call it as the altar of obedience. Um, from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. And then we see that the second altar is the altar of intimacy and of the pilgrim's walk. And then the third altar is the altar of commitment and separation. That he was looking for a city that was uh, eternal, whose foundations was eternal and whose builder was God himself. And then finally, we see that the fourth altar is the altar of sacrifice. Um, where he was willing to offer his son as uh, as a sacrifice simply because God told him and he was willing to do that by faith and knowing that God was powerful and able enough to raise him again from the dead um, and all of this um, he was aware of but what I want to leave us with um, with learning and why I thought it was necessary for us to learn about the altars of Abraham was uh, can someone read uh, Romans chapter 12 verse 1 please actually I'll read it for us it says in Romans chapter 12 verse 1 uh, this is Paul right Apostle Paul says I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service Right, I beseech you, that means he's saying, I beg you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, um, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, just like Abraham, we are called to be a people uh, who would build altars unto the Lord who will constantly remember everything what God has done and he will constantly be thankful to everything that he has done that we will constantly offer up sacrifices um, you know for everything uh, that he has done and that he does in our lives because he is worthy um, and so there are two things here one is that we are called to be men and women who build altars but in conclusion, when Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, offer yourself as living sacrifice, that means God is not only asking us to build altars, God is asking us to be on the altar. Are you with me? Right? That he is not only asking us to build altars of worship where divinity would meet with humanity, where there would be a divine exchange that would happen. He is not just saying build the altar. He's saying, build the altar and lay yourself on the altar that you have built as a living sacrifice. Right? Um, this is a lovely poem there by uh, Elisha Hoffman. It says, um, is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the spirit control. You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. And so uh, if there's anything that we can learn from the life of Abraham is a life of surrender, it's the life of laying down our all. That's really what worship is all about, is laying down your 100% and uh, obeying God uh, for what he says and trusting the trustworthy one. Trusting the one who is trustworthy. And that's basically what we will learn, that we learn from the life of Abraham. Okay? Uh, right? I hope everybody's still alive, everybody's doing well. Um, that's the end of the session for today. Um, we'll pause here. Thank you for joining, and uh, we'll continue again uh, the next week. All right? Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining. God bless you all. Thank you.